Welcome to Christ Church. The fall season is nearly upon us, and that means Christ Church returns to its normal schedule of two services Sunday morning at 9 and 11. Nine o'clock worship remains a streamlined communion service in our chapel with message, hymns, and prayer. 11 o'clock worship has the return of our choir and artfully constructed liturgy. I so hope to be able to greet you in person one of the Sundays ahead. Maybe you can make it September 25th for the kickoff of our fall program year. We'll celebrate after the 11 a.m. service with a delicious meal served downstairs in Phillips Hall. There will be games, activities, and a special performer for kids, a ministry fair, and information about all of the events coming up in the life of the church from now until the first of the year. Please check out ChristChurchNYC.online for everything that's going on. But now, let's turn our attention Godward. God's amazing grace lies at the heart of the Christian faith. Grace signifies that the worst thing is never the last thing. That though we stumble and procrastinate with our attempts to love in the manner of Jesus, nothing separates us from the love of God. Grace is a word of astonishing hope, fully revealed in the resurrection faith. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Holy God, your word is like fire. By the power of your spirit, illumine our sight and inflame our hearts, that we may live lives more faithful to your will. Amen. Isaiah paints a powerful image of God's grace. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. In the 15th chapter of Luke, Jesus tells several parables revealing the extravagant nature of God's grace. Luke chapter 15, verses one through 10. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, which one of you having a hundred sheep and losing one of them does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she's found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Chatting with my son and daughter and their friends about their relationship with social media this past week, I was surprised to learn that a number of them, including my own offspring, said that they had never signed on to Facebook or had recently signed off, although most had a highly curated group of friends and family on Instagram, which, as we know, is also owned by Facebook. Following the conversation, my daughter pointed me to an older blog addressing the seven ways to be insufferable on Facebook, in which the blogger describes how annoying statuses 
reek of motivations like image crafting, narcissism, attention craving, and jealousy inducing. Some of this gets amplified into those called influencers with thousands, millions of followers, which seems the holy grail of the social media empire, everyone striving to become a piston in the engine of consumerist exploitation. Which got me thinking about all the ways we market ourselves. After all, social media projects a personally constructed presentation of oneself, a photoshopped picture, as it were, often literally. And as the blog suggests, this picture reeks of hiding in plain sight, a doctored image masquerading as 100% authentic. In this way, everyone becomes a curated product, an advertisement at least three steps removed from what's real, and a target for all other advertisers with similar taste. Of course, we don't need technology and social media to reveal that we have an innate desire to hide behind projected images of ourselves. We've played the game of masquerade forever. Seems to me that social media has only hotly exploited what's always been there. That we're all liars and pretenders to varying degrees can hardly be denied, can it? We let others see what we want them to see, and we hide the rest. Take me for existence. <laughs> I got to say that again. <coughs> Take me for instance. I've been an okay minister over my career, I suppose, landing in this modest house of worship in the middle of a fabulous city. I've accumulated academic degrees, assembling a diverse and talented staff and congregation. And you know, left to my own devices, I'm inclined to take credit for all of it. Not only that, but credit for growing up in a reasonably loving and stable home in the wealthiest nation in the world. Credit for the astonishing opportunities I was presented with. Credit for your presence. Credit for this place. I take credit for speaking the word of God. Even on those days I know for certain in my heart of hearts, I speak for no one but myself. Actually, wearing a robe on Sunday is something of a two-edged sword. On the one hand, it serves the useful purpose of minimizing the individual and accentuating the long history of the rich tradition I represent. That's the point of the outfit. On the other hand, I tell you for certain that it's a disguise, a masquerade. Will the real Stephen Bauman step out from the robes, please? But if instead I were to wear clothes like this, or faded jeans and a flannel shirt like many preachers today, would I be more fully disclosed to you? Or in the guise of a humble, aw shucks, just plain old me persona, had I simply exchanged one costume for another with no one the wiser about the inner person? From the perspective of our spiritual tradition, there's a good one word descriptor for me. And it's a word I rarely ever use in reference to myself, a word that's fallen out of fashion in mainstream churches. Sinner. I don't know if that's because we feel as though we're beyond it or that we've concluded sin was part of a faulty theological system. Certainly, it's a word prone to abuse in many church environments. In these last decades, we've been weaned on more positive ideas, such as people are all basically good. We emphasize the importance of positive self-esteem. That's a useful psychological concept, of course, up to a point. The power of positive thinking and so forth. But it is very hard to make complete sense of the world, let alone the gospel, without making some sense of sin. For one thing, Jesus is frequently accused of hanging out with people that are referred to as sinners. They seem to be his friends. That's what the righteous types were saying about him in today's lesson. This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. <laughs> and I bet he drinks with them too, since on another occasion he was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard. 
Lots of eating and lots of drinking going down with the wrong sorts of people. You know, with all the sinners. What's interesting is that those who are identified as the sinners are the ones who get Jesus' attention as opposed to the men of the temple. They think hanging out with the riffraff taints Jesus and probably themselves by association. These righteous types have already determined who's in and who's out of God's favor. Jesus starkly overturns their suppositions. The Apostle Paul, in writing to his friend Timothy, referred to himself as, get this, a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But the spirit of Jesus hung out with him for a long while, which eventually led Paul to write, the saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Now, as I stand here today, I would not go so far as to say that I'm, in, I'm the foremost sinner present in worship here, but I will say that I think I'm in good company. And the use of the word good here has an ironic sensibility. We're all in the same boat. While I have my disguises without even knowing what yours are, I bet the house that you have them. And while I suspect that a pretty good sampling of the varieties of human weakness is represented in those tuning in, it's all to the good that we've showed up. You know, there's very little that separates us from those outside church other than this one thing. We might know who our real friends are, that is, friends who can see behind the disguise and still love us. And we know for certain that among them is this man named Jesus. If anyone sees us as we are, he does. You might recall that John Newton, the composer of that famous hymn, Amazing Grace, was a slaver who eventually renounced his profession and became an active abolitionist. His tombstone epitaph sums up his experience. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slavers in Africa, was, by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. That's quite an epitaph. John Newton is part of the good sinner company. Jesus evidently hung out with him and probably sat at his table sharing food and drink. I find comfort in that. Here's the good news of the gospel. No masquerade artist stands beyond God's reach. This is called grace, amazing grace. There is no so-called sinner, no outcast, no unworthy person, no one who falls beyond the pale of God's love. As Philip Yancey points out, the wonderful if maddening truth is there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. And there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. This sort of God makes us uncomfortable, edgy. Grace throws out our measurements of fairness. Aren't we often very sure about those who don't deserve the same as us? We're generally very clear about who belongs and who doesn't, who's up and who's down, who's our equal and who isn't. The righteous types in the gospel lesson knew these things for sure. But then that was part of their disguise. Their self-righteousness was part of their disguise. Tellingly, they weren't part of the good company of friends. They could have been included, of course. All they had to do was pull up a chair and join the party. After all, that's what the wayward do according to the parables. When the lost are found, they throw a party. No wonder there's so much eating and drinking among Jesus' friends. They're constantly partying. Those of you that know me know that I find this behavior quite inspirational. 
Now, there are some persons in disguise today listening in who believe they don't deserve such unconditional love. They know they are beyond God's reach or want to remain so, so they'll hold this grace at arm's length. Of course, to be beyond God's reach would make them larger than God. It's an inverted form of arrogance, silly, really. Others sense that to accept such love would result in radical change in their lives, like removing their disguise for good, like John Newton. So out of fear of discovery or deep preference for maintaining the disguise, they'll keep the gift wrapped up unopened on a closet shelf and wind up living a much smaller life than they might, spending out their days exchanging one costume for another. Theologically speaking, I'm a radical grace man. <laughs> How else to account for the elevation of a criminal loser into the sparkling golden dome sitting on a throne up there? That's the sort of startling reversal that lies at the heart of the culture of our God. Humans tried to kill it, radical grace. They still do try to kill it or ignore it, but it wouldn't, couldn't die and won't let go. I tell you, it is stitched into every inch of creation fabric. God's amazing grace. For God's sake, and for your own, join the party. In the Lord, in the Lord, my soul's been anchored in the Lord. In the Lord, in the Lord, my soul's been anchored in the Lord. In the Lord, in the Lord, my soul's been anchored in the Lord. In the Lord.
Friends, here at the end, please join me in the prayer Jesus gave us to say that's become our family prayer. And as you say it, stay alert to the presence and power of God's amazing grace. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. <laughs>